peace of Christ be with you. Let us take three deep breaths that our awareness might expand to recognize the presence of the living spirit. Friends, let us worship in beloved community. Let us set our minds on the goodness of God. Good morning. Would you join me in our call to worship? Enter into God's presence, singing whatever is on your heart. Hear us, O God, as we call to you. Join with one another in solidarity, exploration, and seeking. Bind us together, Holy Spirit, as we journey together. Break free from past understandings that no longer serve. Liberate us, O Christ, from that which holds us captive. Would you join me in singing our opening hymn, God of the Sparrow? Hymn 22, God of the Sparrow. <laughs> Good morning again and welcome. 
whether you are joining us for the first time, the many times, wherever, however, whenever you're worshiping with us, we hope you feel that special connection, uh, that spiritual connection to this community of sisters and brothers following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, or at least doing our best. Would you join me in our community prayer as printed on the screen? God, you are described by many names, but captured fully by no name. You are not only the God of elusiveness, but the God of closeness. You are presence and engagement. Forgive us for rendering you as a stale piece of art, comfortably set in a corner to admire when we have time. Help us to embrace you, be it in wrestling or holding, that our relationship might grow. Help us as individuals and as a church not to be afraid of our actual experiences of what can rightly be identified as you. Amen. Our prayers continue in quiet. Ever-present God, you walk with us through good times and bad, mountain top and valley deep. Your footsteps are our guide, your hands are our support. We trust in your forgiveness that you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. We have knocked and are grateful that you open the door. Open our hearts and minds to your spirit. As in your son's aim, his sake. Amen. For our time of discovery this morning, I want to share with you part of a story called Excellent Ed. It's by Stacy McAnulty. It's about this dog named Ed, who is a part of a very loving family and a family of children who are excellent at many things. For example, Elaine was an excellent soccer player. Ed preferred to carry the ball in his mouth. The twins, Emily and Elmer, were excellent at math and could add faster than a calculator. Ed could only count to four. Edith was an excellent ballerina and could twirl on her toes. Ed could twirl too, but it wasn't the same. Ernie baked excellent cupcakes. Ed agreed. Now, Ed keeps trying to be excellent at these things that the humans are excellent at, and he's just not quite doing it right. But then, towards the end of the story, he realizes that there are so many things at which he is excellent. For example, Ed is excellent at warming feet, Elaine whispered to Edith. And then he finds other things he's excellent at. For example, one of the kids accidentally drops some of their food and Ed licks it up off the floor. He is excellent at cleaning the floor. One day when the family comes home, Ed greets them with licks and doggy hugs and kisses. He is excellent at welcoming his family home. And so by the end of the book, Ed realizes that he doesn't have to be excellent at the same things his family is excellent at. He can be excellent at his own dog things. And I hope we remember that as we move through this world. We are all excellent. We are excellent children of God, each and every one of us. And we are all excellent in our own unique, wonderful ways. I don't have to be excellent exactly in the way you are excellent. We can be excellent very differently. That's how God created us, as excellently unique individuals. So I hope that you will not only rejoice in your own excellence, but you will also honor and rejoice in the excellence of everyone else. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere everywhere you may go. Amen. Now, 
as we move to our time of prayer and our time of joys and concerns, I do invite you to share with us what is on your heart and mind today. You can type it into the comments section if you're watching with us on Facebook or be in touch with us throughout the week so we can be in prayer together. Certainly there is a lot that we carry with us throughout any given week. A lot of joy, a lot of concern. So let us bring all of that to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Loving God, in the scriptures, after Jacob wrestles with an angel, he is blessed. And we too come to you for blessing this morning. There are so many times in our lives when we feel alienated, downtrodden, alone. There are so many times in our lives when we see others dealing with pain, grief, and injustice. Oh, for them and for us to know your blessing. So hear us now as we share our prayers of concern with you. It can be easy for us to wallow in our misery or to simply give up. But you, O oh God, encourage us to stand strong, to seek the blessings that you provide, to recognize the many ways that you are with us, giving us strength and courage. Be with us now. Guide our lives. There is so much that brings us joy and hope. Hear us now as we share our prayers of gratitude with you. Gracious God, may we remember that your grace is poured out on us, not because of anything we have done, but because of your great and generous love for each one of us. Help us to receive your blessing and in turn to be a blessing to someone else. And hear us now as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Why do some traditions say you should not speak the name of God as if that might offend the Holy One? Well, I will bless the Lord and name God to the world. How can anyone be afraid to praise your name? You are the light of glorious and Gracious, living water. 
first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 17. Listen now for how the Spirit may be speaking to you this morning through these words. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. This is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Our Older Testament reading comes from the 32nd chapter of Genesis, verses 22 to 31. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. The same night he, Jacob, got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Jacob took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint, and he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed 
Penuel limping because of his hip. Friends, this is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The staff put together a devotional, and we titled it Weirdest Summer Ever. And that's about as good a name as we could come up with to describe what we've been living in. There's a need to put a name to things, to understand what they are so we know how to navigate them, how to face them. Did you notice that in the midst of Jacob's encounter with this mysterious figure, that one of the things he asks for at the conclusion is his opponent's name. We want to know what we're facing and how long it will go on so we know how to navigate it. Doesn't that sound familiar? And sometimes it's only in looking back that we can put the proper name to it, that we can understand it, if not fully, then more fully. With the events of this last week, I can't help but think about John Lewis, wondering what name he would have put to that first crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge at the time and right after. And now looking back on how we name that pivotal moment in our collective story. There's a wonderful book about names put forth uh, by uh, Matthew Fox, this great purveyor of original blessing rabble rouser in the church. In it, he approaches the most unnameable subject of all, God, the truly unnameable one. His book is called Naming the Unnameable. It's an important book because one of the things it says to me is the better we get at naming things, the better we get at navigating things, the better we get at living. Let me share a few of these names for you. 89 in all, I won't give you all of them. Some of them are quite familiar. God is love. That's in our own Christian scriptures. And if I asked many of you how you would describe God, indeed I have before, often the answer one would hear and I have heard is God is love. Some are less sentimental. God is reality, which actually describes it quite well, if you ask me. And this is scriptural too, believe it or not. Remember when Moses encounters this mysterious presence and and asks for the name and God just says, I am. Tell them I am. But it's not just a present expression. God's name in that moment is actually the past, present, and future tense of the verb to be. God is what was, what is, and will be. Some of these names point to a spiritual underpinning to all of reality, this divine presence at the heart of all things. Fox describes this by saying God is the the cosmic Christ. Others sometimes say the universal Christ or the Buddha nature. Fox uses as well. This transcendent presence rooted in divinity within all things. Fox devotes an entire section in his book to feminine names for God. The feminine is underrepresented in many of our traditions, yet is a stream that flows somewhat even subversively through them. Among them, Fox includes the Jewish feminine name for God, Shekinah, which points to the divine glory of the presence of God glory of the divine presence. Some of these names are not intuitive at first, 
but actually can open new doors for us. One that I found particularly helpful in, oh, I'd say the past year or so, is this name, God is Chaos. Now, that is more familiar in some traditions. Hinduism, for example, points to this. And I found it helpful for me in my own Christian walk. Even before the pandemic, one of the ways God is chaos helped me is looking at this chaotic coming apart that we're experiencing on an ecological level and what that means. And it's easy to get lost in despair there. But what naming God as chaos does for us is not say that God inflicts chaos on us, but rather recognizes the potential inherent in chaotic moments. Fox says that chaos is an important part, is a necessary part of every creative process. It shows up there. And so chaos isn't just the coming apart of some stable structures, but it is the seedbed, it is the birth canal to the formation of new structures and ways of being. And when I think about what's coming apart with our earth, what I realize is perhaps pregnant in this chaotic moment is a new birth and a new way of being that will be more sustainable, a holier order. If we can recognize the divine potential of this moment, we can wake up, we can show up, and we can grow up. Another name that I've found a kinship with the older I get, God is mystery. It's hard for us to allow some things to remain simply as mystery. It's far easier to dwell in the land of absolute certainty. But God is mystery is more expansive. There's more possibility. Fox even includes names such as this. Uh, God is the planetary mind field. Not mind field, mind field. There's truly something for everyone in his book, and I think that's the point. To push beyond the boundaries of traditional Christian naming. Other religions do this better. Judaism has more names than we tend to use. Hinduism, of course. Islam has 99 names. Indigenous traditions often have many representations for the divine. Fox actually calls this his most radical book. That's saying something for a man that the Vatican has tried to silence. His most radical book, what is it, or why is it so radical? What does it threaten? Well, in part, it threatens the institutional church because it's returning the ability to, to name reality to the people. And when the institutional church loses the exclusive naming rights to God, it loses its power and control. It can't control what it can't name. If it doesn't own the lexicon, well, what use is the institution? Well, actually, there are plenty of uses for the institution. They just shift. Rather than telling you how it has to be and how you have to think, they become a gathering force, a place to bring people together for mutual exploration, for shared practice, for the growth, for the communal experience of the divine and the evolution of the community as a result. But that's a dramatic shift. Fox unapologetically wants to restore trust in the human experience of this great mystery that we call God and life. Because experience is the heart of the mystical path. When Jacob has his mystical encounter, his experience of what he later recognizes as God in some form. He comes away with a couple of important things. Jacob, like many of us, spends his life searching for blessing. And he doesn't always do it the right way. At the very beginning of 
uh, our encounter is with him, what does he do? He steals his birthright from his older brother, Esau. And in this moment, when Jacob is wrestling with the unknown, what does he say? I will not let you go unless you bless me. And there's a lesson in that for us, to persist, to stay in, to hold on, to not let go until we receive some blessing from our struggle, some, something that will help us grow, be better, evolve. That struggle is not without suffering. Jacob does not emerge unscathed. He's limping from his wound in his hip. He walks now differently. And there's a lesson in that for us, too. Our growth often comes with scars and suffering and discomfort. Again, it's not to say that God inflicts all discomfort on us, but rather the discomfort often becomes a vessel for our own growth. If you want this sermon in one sentence, here it is. Comfortable people rarely change. Why would they? So our discomfort isn't always an enemy. In fact, sometimes it's the path. It's the sacred path, if we can stay in it long enough to retrieve that blessing. Jacob receives something else important from this encounter. He receives a new name. God names him Israel. And what does Israel mean? It means I've wrestled with God, with reality. Jacob's vocation then becomes our vocation to wrestle with it to not retreat to islands of comfort, especially for those of us who live primarily in comfort, but to stay engaged, to see the struggle as possibility. And all of this comes full circle because when you stay engaged in the struggle, you not only gain blessing, but you gain the wisdom and insight to look back and to rename and to reframe the realities that we face in ways that are more hopeful and give us more possibility where we only saw despair first, now we see possibility. Like Fox, I brought my own list of names, names that we could use for this weirdest summer in which we're living. What if when looking back or even in the midst of, we saw these as not only times of division, but times of growth. Times to redress old wrongs and dress old wounds. Painful times, but not unproductive times. What if these times were not simply divided times, but times when we discovered a new unity, a return to a unity through a recognition of a common threat that cares not what we believe. What if these times were times where we remembered the gifts of science and rededicated ourselves to the pursuit of human knowledge and truth, knowing what life-giving potential they have, which is no threat to our faith, but an expression of our faith, which is our love for neighbor. What if these were times where we rediscovered the spiritual practice of sacrifice for the good of neighbor? What if these were times when we not only saw that our inequalities were exposed, but we mustered up the energy to do something about them. Think about what every family is considering right now in the country, whether or not to send their kids to school, if it's safe, and how to do so. And watch what's happening. Some are coming together in, in paying for expensive tutors and private teachers, and who could blame any family who does that, giving the best to their children? What about everybody else who can't afford to do that? 
We don't have the resources to do that. We look at that and just say, that's the way it is, or could these be the times in which we said, you know what, that's not good enough for the richest land on the planet. What if these were times when we not only felt like everything was falling apart, but we reached down and discovered strength we didn't even know we had to rise back up? What if these were times when our faith didn't sort of dwindle away through the entropy of the modern time, but actually our faith took deeper root, grew up a little bit, matured, and bore new kinds of fruit? What if these were times where we reached across old boundaries and old borders to produce new bonds of beloved community? That's my list. What would your list be like? How would you like to name this potentially pregnant moment? What blessing would you like to grasp as a person or as a part of us as a people? Come to this table to be fed with the mystical union with the mysterious one. Go out into the world and find out. Amen. Life of this beloved community continues to thrive uh, and sometimes struggle, if I might say so myself at least, uh, in these times. Some of the highlights that I think we would all do well to know about, and of course you are more than welcome, you are welcome and included in any of these. Uh, our Outreach Commission, just after this worship service, if you're watching live, 11.30 a.m. will be uh, gathering, I believe, for the last time, the 21-Day Equity Challenge. If you've read, done any of the readings, listened to any of the podcasts, done any of those activities, we would love to have you as part of the conversation there. You can hop over to wpctiburon.org and find the Zoom links for that conversation. Um, and, I, and of course, if you haven't done all 21 days or if you haven't done any, there's never a bad time to start. So, of course, pick up wherever you left off or jump in now. Uh, and kind of a personal note, if I may, uh, our, we would be coming home uh, this weekend from our high school mission trip, from the second of two youth mission trips we do over the summer. And we, we traditionally will send um, our students around on their own sometimes for other uh, service project or educational experiences but it it just came to uh, just to keep in prayer those partners that we've been serving our the hearts of our students and our leaders go out to them uh, who asked for us to come and we had to inform them that we just couldn't do it so uh, we just want to encourage you to uh, i guess if in a moment of prayer reflection think about those people and places that are serving, trying and struggling even more to serve the needs of those communities, in particular in Santa Cruz and San Diego. And speaking of our middle and high schoolers and our Friday morning men's group, we continue to collect meals on Wednesday mornings at the church uh, for people at both in Sausalito, uh, primarily Anchor Outs and also St. Vincent de Paul. We've 
just eclipsed 3,000 meals that we've collected since this began. So big thanks to Jeff and Elaine, two of our high school leaders who've made that happen. And our middle school families have just started uh, this week taking care of a pop-up pantry in Sausalito at the Marin Ship Park. The reason I bring this up now is uh, as school starts in some way, shape, or form in the near future, we will probably need some help to fill in some of the gaps that our students have been covering. So look for information in the e-news. Reach out to me directly if you have any interest in, in uh, being present at a pop-up pantry on Tuesday mornings or um, supplying meals or transporting those meals that we collect on Wednesdays. Um, we at least would like some extra help while our students and families kind of figure out what their routine is going to be going forward. So with all that good news, uh, let us join in our closing hymn. As we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper together, if you haven't had the chance already to gather something to use for communion, I invite you to do that now. Again, it can be anything to eat and anything to drink. I have with me here bread and grape juice, which is what we traditionally use. But anything that you have on hand will certainly be perfect for this meal that we share together. And as we prepare to come to the table, will you join me in song? Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. And as we come, we are reminded that Jesus invites us to come in peace. So I invite you to share the peace of Christ. If you are watching and participating in worship with someone else, share the peace of Christ with one another. If you are by yourself in your home right now, may I offer the peace of Christ to you always. Amen. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Come, come from, from the, the north, north and the south, come, come from, from the east and the west, come sit at the table in the kingdom of God. As we come to the table together, whatever table it may be, it is God's table. And this is a table where everyone can come to receive. This is a table where there is safety and acceptance. This is a table which welcomes, invites, provides, unites. This is a table where strength is restored. So come, Come to the table where all are welcomed and where all are nourished. Will you join with me? God be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, creator and renewer of all life. Time and again you seek us out, breathing again the breath of life into the deflated places of our lives. And so we come to your table again to praise you, to meet you face to face, and to taste yet again what your steadfast love can do. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with those others considered unworthy. Through him, faith and hope were born again for so many. And so, 
As we remember the words and acts of Jesus, we offer our own lives, leaving behind what we do not need, seeking new paths full of risen life in you. As followers of Christ, in communion with the saints and prophets from all times and places, we proclaim and live out this holy mystery as we lift our voices in praise. Amen. Will you repeat after me? Holy, holy, holy God. Holy, holy, holy God. Everywhere we see your glory. Everywhere we see your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Will you sing with me? Come to the table of love. Come to the table of love. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of love. And at this table of grace and of love, we remember that last night of Jesus' life when he gathered for a meal with his closest friends. And as they were eating, he took the bread. And after giving thanks for it, he blessed it and he broke it. And he offered it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this remembering me. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, he said, remembering me. This is the feast of God for the people of God. Wherever you may be, we are united by God's Spirit through this meal, so let us partake together. This is the bread of life. And this is the cup of blessing. Amen. Will you sing with me one more time? We go from this table in peace. We go from this table in peace. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. We go from this table in peace. Let us pray. In deep gratitude for this moment and this meal, we give ourselves to you, loving God. Lead us from this moment in peace to live as changed people, because we have shared this living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much of us, Encourage many through us. Amen. In 760, bring many names. <laughs>
now receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is Father and Mother of us all, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, be with you every day. Amen. <laughs>